Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Well, hello, this is Stan again in Gainesville, Florida, and welcome to our fifth, I can't believe it, anniversary show. Hey, this is Ellen calling in from the beautiful tropics, and we are very excited to have a very special guest and good friend with us today, lighting designer extraordinaire Natasha Katz. Woohoo! And <laughs> this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore area of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers and Sister. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to episode 260, and that means this is our fifth anniversary show. I'm wow. confused. I'm confused. How do you get to 260 when there's 52 weeks a year? It's math. It doesn't work. Yes, it does. Yeah. No, 52 <laughs> times 2 is what? 104. Yeah, okay. Four, wait a minute, let me do the math. And 104 yeah. times five is what? Is it right? <laughs> We're five lighting designers here trying to do math. This is a mistake. That's okay? 520. Anyway, all we know that this is episode 260 and it's uh, our fifth anniversary show. Is my contract up? That's my question. Is my contract <laughs> up? <laughs> yeah, yes, and you don't get unemployment if you quit. So that's don't the problem. Do we have any residuals, anything? No, I don't no, get no any residuals. Royalties. This is a non commercial Oh, broadcast. yeah, I forgot about that. We're socialists. Podcast. So, you know, we've got here today the regular crew with Steve and Stan and Ellen and me. And we have a, an amazing, amazing guest for you today, someone who I have known, actually all of us has known for many, many years. She is basically the queen of lighting design and royalty. also a lighting member. Royalty, lighting royalty. Wait, 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 wait. She, she is, what, what do we call them? Legends of Light. Legend, she's, she's a, a legend, legend of, of light. light. That's true. Yes, we don't give away tacky swords. We don't, <laughs> we don't we give can't away tacky swords. <laughs> We're not commercial. We can't afford a damn tacky sword. <laughs> we, we, I mean, what do swords have to do with lighting design anyway? I just can never figure that out. But that being said, we have wonderful Natasha Katz here. Natasha, how are you today? Hey, you guys <laughs> and Ellen. Thanks for being here. Oh, yeah. my God. Thank you for having me. And we can thank Ellen for, for nabbing yeah, you. Yeah, she set you up. She <laughs> set us up. Because she runs away from us. <laughs> we could have done it without That's Ellen. That's right. So thank you, Ellen, for getting Natasha You're here. You're more than and welcome. Thanks yeah, to Natasha for being. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. I'd go anywhere Ellen goes. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> How about yeah. Las Vegas in November? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about Las that, actually. Las Vegas in November. What's happening in Las Vegas in November? Well, oh, I you know. know, a little trade show we put on. But Natasha's always busy. But we could Zoom you in, you know. We, we are very good at that now. Yeah, we all are, right? Oh. That's yeah. Yeah, that's great. Listen, my, my daughter was, I gave birth in Las Vegas to my first child wow. when I was working on EFX. So you gave birth in Las Vegas. What was that like? If anybody wants to have a baby, it's a great place to have a baby. I'll say that. I mean, did you have to leave the casino floor? <laughs> it, it was just like that it was very similar jerry harris is like sit down we're not done with that yet <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get to that story later but you know what, what do you all think this has been five years we've been doing this five years i'm telling would you, have thunk it? And you i know, didn't think it would last five weeks and da <laughs> David, I, th I think you failed to mention the other the other good soldiers who have soldiered on with us for five years. That's right. You did. That's right. Well, That's of course, right. Brackley, right? Right. Um, right. Uh, Anne. We have Driscoll. We it have Anne. We have Zach. Both Anne's, Anne McMills and Anne Militello. Oh, true. And of course, Ellen too. And uh, and who are we forgetting? You said Driscoll, Brackley. No. Okay. Yeah, these are the, these are guest hosts that we've had for many many years, and uh, we can thank them for keeping the show fresh and their careers <laughs> are not suffered else. amazingly. So, unlike our careers, that's a whole other story. I mean, our careers have suffered. Terribly. By the way, your math is right. Fifty-two times five is definitely two hundred and sixty. Thank, thank you, you Ellen. <laughs> Stan, are you a full professor? <laughs> He's got his Stan abacus out really right quiet. now. Not in math. Stan. <laughs> <laughs> he knows the new math. I know the old math. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Well, anyway, five years, 260 episodes, over 130 countries and territories, including the Faroe Islands. And 
Antar- where was Antarctica? It? Ukraine. Oh, oh we, we had, had, we had a couple in the Ukraine. Uses in Ukraine. Yes, for sure. Yeah, amazing. And uh, and you know, God bless them. Um, and uh, over three hundred thousand downloads. And yet, McMurdo, McMurdo Base in Antarctica rejects us coldly. <laughs> they just they <laughs> won't even take my emails <laughs> anymore. <laughs> anyway, let's get on to our now special to the show. guest because it's a lot here. more Come interesting. On. Yes, Natasha's here. I mean, it took us years to get That's Natasha. Right. And uh, and I think Ellen had to fool her that she was going to be on a different show. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I could listen to you guys forever. Oh, you're so That's sweet. sweet. Anyway, <laughs> hey, wait, I got a question for Natasha. What year did you take your union exam? Do you remember? Oh, I don't. Early 80s. Yes, it was, because guess who also took it that year? That's where did I you? met you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I failed. Wow. By the way. <laughs> he was the one looking on your paper while you drew. That's I was I was I copied your design. Yes, that's right. No. Back then you couldn't do that. that uh, back then you had to draft everything. It was crazy. We yeah. had a full day of drafting. It was insane. And we had that practical that we had to and take. Do you remember the show, and the practical, what what it was? The gin game. Yes, exactly. You guys are yeah, vintage. I remember yeah. 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 You guys are vintage. But, 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 but we were both much younger then, right? And we were like, oh, wow, this is so cool. We're going to be New York designers. And Natasha made it, and I didn't. <laughs> so there you go. I didn't pass my first year either. Oh. Well, I, and then cool. the second year that I went back, Gil Helmsley was one of the interviewers. And I got to tell you, I was so nervous. So I walked in the room. I don't know what the question was. But he said to me, Natasha, why don't you walk out? And just pretend this never happened and start all over oh again. <laughs> and I came back in and I passed. Oh, yeah. I was so nervous. Well, you oh, were my lucky God. that Gilbert was there. Because Gilbert, Gilbert as, if you listen to the show, has been, was a mentor for me, for me as well. He gave me my first job. And uh, thank God I got in, as, in the professional membership. Because uh, I could never do a shop order that fast. <laughs> that <laughs> test was tough. Wasn't you that had to, tough? You had to write it. The, you had to do it by exactly the right line weights. Oh. You had to put the number of units at the end of each pipe. Mm-hmm. It, it was a different world than yeah. it is Real today. Real gatekeeping. Sure. <laughs> that guy. That, that's a whole other story. Anyway, let's get started with Natasha, and we'll get Ellen to tell us a little bit about her. Okay. Uh, Natasha Katz is a New York-based lighting designer who works extensively for theater, opera, dance, concerts, and permanent lighting installations around the world. Her recent Broadway credits include Springsteen on Broadway, Diana, All My Sons, Burn This, The Prom, Frozen, Long Day's Journey into Night, Cats, School of Rock, An American in Paris, Skylight, The Glass Menagerie, Once, Follies, The Coast of Utopia, Salvage, and Aida. Natasha trained at Oberlin College and early in her career was mentored by Roger Morgan, a lighting designer and theater consultant. Her first Broadway production as lighting designer was the play Pack of Lies in 1985. Natasha has won six Tony Awards for Long Day's Journey into Night, An American in Paris, The Glass Menagerie, The Coast of Utopia, Once, and Aida, as well as a slew of other awards, including Live Design's Award for Sustained Achievement in Theatrical Lighting Design in 2016. She is currently represented on Broadway with Aladdin, which opened in 2014, and MJ, the new Michael Jackson musical. She also just opened an off-Broadway show with Suffs at the Public Theater. So I guess the basic question is, what got you into lighting design? Um, You know, I've been asked that question a lot, and I realized uh, that I'm really, I'm an accidental lighting designer in the sense that I just, all I ever wanted to do was work in the theater. I didn't, uh, you know, a lot of people know now when they're 15 years old because they have such great programs at schools and stuff that they want to be lighting designers. But that was not me. That was not my dream at all. I just wanted to work in the theater. And then when I was at Oberlin College, they had a uh, internship program and um, I ended up with, for whatever reason, with Roger Morgan, who you mentioned, lighting designer. And he happened to be, so I got a, a full semester's credit to work with Roger. And during that period of time, he was working on a show called I Remember Mama, Richard Rogers' Last Musical with leave all men and the out of town tryout in Philadelphia and the New York, the time in New York was exactly during my 
semester. So I, um, I did that. I went and I went out of town. It was, uh, I guess, a difficult process. What did I know? I was just so happy to be there. And then I started to learn about lighting and I like lighting and, um, and, and all the people that I met, that there were wonderful people on the show. Marsha Madera, Roger, Brand Farron um, worked on the show. Da- uh, was it da- yeah, David Mitchell, Theoni Aldridge? It was wow. unbelievable. And um, then I started to, as I met a lot of people, and I was asked to do these jobs, and I started to work as an associate. And I didn't go back to Oberlin. I always thought that I could if I needed to, but then I just continued to work and work and work. And then at, there was also Lester Polakoff in New York. Mm-hmm. And this is this is like so from the past, but he had this amazing studio school called the Lester Polakoff Studio and Form of Stage Design, where all the professional lighting and just scenic designers and designers taught there. So the bride, Jennifer Tipton, Peggy Clark was my teacher. Tom Skelton was my teacher, uh, life drawing classes. So he, it was sort of a, a a la carte way to learn about lighting, but I didn't go to school for it. I'm definitely a product of an, of on, on the job training. Wow. That's great. You said you were, you were you just wanted to work in the theater. Did you think you wanted to be an actress or a producer or director or, or just a storyteller? Like, what was it? I'm uh, never an actress. <laughs> I, I, I grew up in New York City, so my parents took me, me to the too. theater all yeah, the time. Yeah. You two grew up in Brooklyn. New York? That counts. Yes, it does. That's more than counts. That's, <laughs> it's funny that we never that's met. That's better than Manhattan. It's just weird. My aunt <laughs> was in Manhattan, and she was a big opera fan and a Broadway goer. And she just took me all the time like you, but she did don't work in it. Just appreciate it. She didn't want me to go. So yeah, my whole life was New York city. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There you go. Well, that's what it was. It was just a love of yeah, theater right. really. Yeah. All right. So we have um, a 15 part question here. Uh, <laughs> go write this down. What are your favorite <laughs> yeah. light sources? And how did you transition from conventional sources to LED? And do you still love tungsten? Okay, oh, these are where? very important questions. Be sure you answer these correctly. That way, going to be an exam later. A big later. bucket of fish <laughs> will fall on your head. <laughs> well, I, now I am. Old, I'm an old school gal. Yeah. I guess I am. You know, I, it's funny. I uh, I always felt. I still feel like I'm the youngest one in the room, but I'm not the youngest <laughs> one in the room anymore. But I definitely prefer incandescent light. I think. I, I mean, it just. It's. It. It's just so much nicer on faces and clothes, and it's so much more human, the humanity behind an incandescent fixture. But it's definitely part of the past in so many different ways. As a matter of fact, it's part of the past because there's so much new equipment. But we're we also so this is this is like the world of Broadway for me. So I'm talking about Broadway right now. We're given so we're given so much less real estate. I think I said that right. Mm -hmm. We get so much less room than we used to. And Broadway houses are so small that you can't, where you would hang, where you would have hung two, three or four sets of side light in four different colors, there's no room for it anymore. So it's just one lot. It's what, you know, three moving lights or something. So there's no color mixing like there used to be. Um, uh, so uh, I miss that. That's mm-hmm. for sure. But uh, the transition to LEDs, you know, the LED fixtures have just gotten so much better and better and better and closer and closer to incandescent. And um, they're still not there yet, but no. they are really, really close. I just did. I've done three or four shows recently with um, the Roby Esprit. Mm-hmm. Which so all the moving lights are LEDs on these last couple of performances that I've done, uh, worked on. Suffs is all encores and FR tens, so there's there's no fan noise. It's incredible. You could you can hear a pin drop now. So that is a huge step forward that we've taken because I really do think that lighting did hurt all these shows yeah. with the fan noise. No yeah. question about it. Absolutely. Yeah, I work primarily in opera, so you know it's, it's even a little more important when you have like uh, 
very uh, temperamental conductors. <laughs> right. So you got to be real it's... careful. Yeah. Um, have you tried the uh, the new uh, ETC fixture? The new ETC um, the XA. Uh, the, yeah, luster fixture. The, the, the luster the double, three. The yeah. double red. Yeah. Have you seen it? Because it's pretty uh, pretty decent, I must say. I've it's heard getting, it's yeah, great. We, we yeah. just got we just got eight it. of them, and we did them on dance. And the I I didn't see it live, but my colleague, who's a dance designer for many years, was like, he said, "It's unbelievable. It's just, it's just beautiful." But I, I, I have a follow up question on the LEDs, though. Did do you think that it did it make it easier to make changes on the fly, having that quick the ability to change things? You know, a simpler from the console rather than send a guy up on the change the gels or move the focus or did it make did it make you more efficient or less efficient? I'm just curious. Uh, oh, there's no question. More efficient. Yeah. I didn't have to pick a single color right on this last show that I yeah. did. So, uh, you know, I'm thankful for my background that I've spent so much time with color and had to pick mm -hmm. color. So mixing color comes to me in whatever way 30 years of doing mm -hmm. this is, mm -hmm. but there's no question that we're saving the producers a ton of money because we don't have to pull out ladders the yeah. way we used to. Also, yeah, I still, uh, I mean, the freedom of the, it's a miracle every time I change a color in a single fixture. I, it's a miracle to me. And then you can track it through the whole show too. I mean, it is, it just seems to me it would just, it would be a welcome to, to us to be, have that fr the freedom is the right word. Yeah. Right. You know, I just did this, uh, this Chernobyl musical in uh, Helsinki and they had a bunch of uh, incandescent fixtures in the front. Uh, and it was very frustrating <laughs> because I couldn't like color tune them. I couldn't, you know, tune them a little cooler or a little warmer that you could do with led. So, you know, they're able to use a lot fewer, few, fewer fixtures, which is nice along with having that incredible flexibility. So, well, exactly what you just said, like you, a costume can come on stage mm -hmm. and what it used to take us to make that costume mm -hmm. <laughs> look good and, and also make the, somebody's face look good. Now you can just, like you right. just said, you just color tune it a little bit. You change mm -hmm. a little backlight, you change a little side light, yeah. and then you got a good looking it's light. Very, it's right. very surgical. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. I have a it's question amazing. about that. What if you mix and match the brands of the LEDs? Are the colors the same or do you have to fine tune them? Uh, uh, so if, when I start a show with uh, all the different brands, we we like, the, let's say my 30 favorite colors, we match all of them so that they are do feel the same. But certain brands don't translate because um, whatever they're, LED engines are different than somebody else's or some are just RGB and they're not RGB AW. So that's where it starts to get a little complicated, but uh, you know, I, this is all part of the process. Like for me, especially with these incredible moving light programmers that I work with, you know, they all were, they're all getting more and more sophisticated and it, it match colors uh, and have learned how to match colors. Yeah. It's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And I'm, you know, we're moving the show to LA in, in a couple of weeks and it's all LED. And I'm like, saying, oh, thank God. Yeah, <laughs> this right? is so much better. Right? This is so much better. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't, it, ta it takes away a certain kind of pressure that you might feel with the director that, yeah. yeah. I did Gypsy with Tyne Daly, Arthur Lawrence directed it. The Oni Aldridge was the lighting, was the costume designer. And I will never forget the day down in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. I uh, I did have color scrollers, but Arthur, the Oni, there was a lavender dress. The Oni took Arthur on stage. And I was like, they are talking about me right now. Oh, and no. Arthur starts pointing at every single light oh, no. and screams from the stage, why don't you have any lavender in these lights? Oh, God. Because, yeah, so I went, I changed all the front light probably from some sort of sort of warm amber thing to lavender. And uh, the dress, uh, the costume all of a sudden just like just sang in mm. front of me. But today we just, you know, tune it a little yeah. bit. Well, like like moving lights, uh, LEDs have saved a lot of lighting designers lives from right? the costume designer coming from behind with the heels clicking. And you know that yeah. in, her, in their right hand is probably some sort of sharp object 
It's either a seam ripper or worse than that, it's a pair of scissors ready for your neck. And you said, quickly, quickly, add, add the lavender, lavender. Oh, okay. That's, that works. So let's talk a little bit about some of your um, current shows, uh, like the Michael Jackson show, the Michael Jackson musical. What is the artistic concept and how does the lighting tell the story? This is going to sound simplistic, but the I, I have to say the show visually, and I'm not just talking about my work, I, I, is extraordinary. And it's because of the really the choreographer, Derek McLean's scenery and um, the co- Paul's costumes. But Chris Wielden has so much to do with it. It is spectacular to look at. The concept of the show, the idea of it really, it takes place in a, a rehearsal room. Before my, I don't know how much you know about Michael Jackson, but before he did his Dangerous tour. So 1992, I think it is. So it's a rehearsal room in LA that looks just like a crummy rehearsal room. And it's got these huge windows on both sides, three sets of windows and windows upstage also with a LED screen upstage of it. But it's a, uh, a, a reporter comes in. It's kind of really a memory piece. And it's it, it's his it's his sort of, yeah, it's his own memory of his own life, essentially. So it's really done in flashbacks. Those flashbacks are translated from light, from a lighting point of view. A lot of it has to do with lights that are embedded in the scenery that you don't know are there. And so, you know, big spoiler alert, if anybody cares, like 10 lighting designers might care. <laughs> we care. But, uh, uh, yeah, I know you guys do. So, so there, uh, we have these uh, bulbs that uh, they're called Kaleska bulbs. So that they they have a LED filament in them that looks like they're from, uh, you know, sign lights with a regular sort of warm incandescent filament. But there's also embedded in it RGB LEDs, so that they can also uh, you can fill the bulb with those colors. So it functions in both ways. So we can be in back in the in the 40s, well, when did the Michael Jackson start? The 50s, where you like feel a marquee light the way you would, or we can translate into further into the future and um, with the different colored LED, different colored LED bulbs all in one bulb. And it's all embedded behind scrim and things like that. A lot of new neon in the show that's also hidden until we turn it on. So it's really, um, and these windows also function there. They have, um, they're frosted. So it looks like it's sunlight coming through and we do a lot of time of day stuff so that it feels real. And then all of a sudden the windows can turn to any color and have gobos on them and function as really kind of this uh, motif of flashbacks. And then you add an LED wall on top of it all. And then Chris, Chris Wielden, the director choreographer, we have panels that also light up that that's what moves from one scene to another. So the transitions are so seamless. You blink and all of a sudden you're in the past, wow. you're in the present. It's amazing. Sounds very the cinematic. Show is amazing. Sounds very cinematic. <laughs> yeah. Super cinematic. I, I, yeah. I'm a, definitely a fan. Wow. Sounds really exciting. Really it nice. is exciting. Come see it when you come to New York. Yeah. It's on my list. On my list. Yeah. That sounds great. The top. So when you walk into a theater like that, what I call a four wall situation where there's nothing in there, how do you scope out the fixtures for your rig? Well, again, you know, Broadway, the great thing about Broadway is that we can pick whatever we want. It's just the only constraint. I get. The real constraint would be money more than anything else. So when it's for a wall, I think, uh, you know, I may, I'm sh- whether your audience knows or not, it means literally that you walk into four empty walls. There's nothing there except some pipes might be hanging there, but that's it. So, um, so uh, yeah, I get to pick whatever I want that seems to befit the show, as long as it's not too expensive. Do you have a lot of manufacturers encouraging you to use their latest equipment? And to take a chance on their equipment? Yeah. Well, yeah. Why wouldn't, you know. And have you made some great discoveries about lights through this process? That's a good question. Like tools? I'd say I would never think I would use that, but I'm glad I chose that. Uh, You uh, you know, I do. Yes, is the answer to that. (laughs) This is exciting. I love this sort of stuff. Yeah, no, me too. And, And, you know, like. stories you want to tell about, like, you, you didn't want to use a Viper, but you tried the Viper. You said, oh, wow, this is a great light. 
Anything off the top of your head? PRG is really helpful about doing demos. They have an amazing demo room, so PRG lighting. And uh, certainly, uh, I mean, they're the same now. But, uh, you know, when Darren DeVerna was there, uh, it was it was just incredible working with Darren. You know, I knew him for so since we were both in our young 20s. But they've continued all that, too. Everybody who's still there is amazing. But they do have this demo room. And um, we just did a demo of every single moving light that Jerry Harris set up for us. Wow. Every single moving light. <laughs> and we compared them all. But, you know, you what I, I have learned is that you, like, you do it at the demo, but you never really know until you right. until you really right. use them. You really don't know what those colors are going to be like on people's faces yeah. or, you know, the ambers seem to drop out on every single moving light. They're never as bright as you want them to be. Right. Somebody explain that to me. Maybe <laughs> one of you guys can explain it. I don't know, but they're never bright enough. Yeah. But anyway, I know they all have something, you know. When you say LEDs, that, yeah, and well, even this, you know, a Viper too. Yeah. The yeah. minute you put a little, little amber, a little warm amber in right, it, it's like huh? not as bright as you want <laughs> yeah. it to be. Well, they, they do age, you know. So that's maybe that's a, a feature, you know. Is, is there any moving light or that you use? Like David was saying, that you're in you're in the theater and you're working it, and and it does something that you didn't expect, and you went, oh, I could use that, or I didn't, and that sort of surprised you in a good way, let's say. Uh, yeah, we don't is... want to talk about bad ways. Okay. <laughs> we don't well, want to want to trash anyone. Way, in a good way. Like, <laughs> well, I didn't expect it to do that, and it did that really well or something. Yeah, this is a really boring story, but it's the first one that came to my head. It's okay. like a Sharpie wash. I never expected it to have the power that it had. Mm. You mm -hmm. know, you can use it as a backlight wash. I always thought it was just a special feature unit, but mm. you could you could use it as backlights. Or any kind of wash, really. Hmm. Yeah. I can, well, can you think of one yourself, something that you've used that maybe a little? Uh, I, I, I could think of some that I did not like that I won't mention on the show. But uh, I, I think the first time I used the Viper, actually, I really do like the Viper. And uh, yeah, I do, too. Now, you know, the show is moving. Uh, we were using Roby T1s in Finland, and it's moving to L.A., and they want me to use either, uh, oh, this is crazy, either Vipers or Ghibli's. You know the Ghibli? Oh, this yeah, it, but I love right? those. Okay, mm. because I'm trying to decide between the two, and uh, and you saying you love them. Did you find a frost uh, troublesome? Because it's only two levels of frost. Well, here's the thing. I love them, mm -hmm. in, I love them in a demo. I haven't yeah. used them for <laughs> okay. real, so Good. there you go. Well, if the light frost <laughs> works, you know, that's the only thing I was concerned about. So, And I still may choose them, but, you know, when you're moving a show from one fixture to another, it's it's always a little, you know... Iffy. Well, have you found a moving light that can soften the way an old Lico used to soften with a gobo in it? Yeah, David did the, the GLP, which one is it? That has a variable frost that's really nice. Well, well a lot of them have yeah. variable frost. I mean, even the Viper has variable frost. Uh, but didn't um, we like that GLP that we saw? It oh, the GLP. Eye? Yeah, 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 yeah. The GLP fixture. Oh, what, yeah. what was the GLP called? profile does it really? Right. It's, S, a, it's a smaller S, light. S350, I think it yes, is. Yes, it's yeah. a 350. It's great light. If you're in a small, if you're in a small situation, it, it doesn't have a lot of oomph. You yeah, know? it's not going to be the. But big, if you're like, yeah. you know, if it's like a thirty foot or forty foot throw, you know, then you know it's a pretty decent light. Actually, it's a great light. Actually, I really like it. I've just fallen in love with these FR tens, the GLP FR tens. Oh, the GLP the yeah, strip it's light stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, strip yeah. lights. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I've I've used them as VTSs. Talk about you know Gilbert Hemsley. You know he used to use the vertical toning strips all the time on the sides of the stage, and he used to take par sixty four strip lights and put them right? on their ends. I remember I've been that. Using these these other fixtures, these new LED fixtures like this um, GLP one, uh, as those in in shows, and they're fantastic because you can also yeah. you can spot them down and flood them out. It's fantastic. Speaking of that, Natasha, didn't you do something really unique on Aida? I remember reading it, probably a magazine that Ellen published, but it was the way you lit a backdrop where you did two verticals and a, and a horizontal around a drop and you shined whatever you used. I don't remember the fixture into itself. So nothing was hitting the drop directly and it was all lit by the ambient. So it was sort of like an indoor, like, does, that ring yeah. a, does that ring a bell for you? That does <laughs> ring a bell for me. Because yeah, talk it, about that because that was a pretty great thing, I thought. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm overusing the word miracle, but that's miracle number two in my life. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Changing <laughs> Colors and the backdrop on Aida. We had we had two feet to light a drop that but well you can't how do I describe it? There was essentially a um so it was a psych, but it ended up being a mus a, a downstage. There was just muslin and two feet up stage of it was a bounce drop. And he had a uh, this kind of horizon line that flew in and flew out. And my dream was that the bottom of the horizon would be one color, like a horizon would be in the top would be another color. So uh, two feet. Oh my God. Mm. We had two feet <laughs> with a 40 foot so, wide. So, so, that, br- so that brilliant thing you did was it was an out of necessity in a sense. Like, that's exactly right. I don't know if I if I ever would have come up with it otherwise. So it was ah, interesting. Par, it was two rows of par sixty-four, uh, par very 64. narrow. Oh my god. Yeah, at, like every two pars. like every 18 inches, right? Pushed as tight as they could possibly go. Right. Every single one on its own dimmer. So that's like the cells that you were just talking about in the LED. You know, now it's just an LED. Now it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Cell on a strip light. But and so that I was able to. So and then I focused it to the center of this of the bounce. Yeah. And so much light bounced in there that it fully lit the psych and it lit it in horizontal I could yeah. control it it's, horizontally going it up. Was and going bri- down. It's, I, it's, I didn't see it, it live, but it's so brilliant. And I wanted to ask you, did it, because I didn't see it myself with my own eyes, did it have a different quality because it was indirect? Uh, as, th- it definitely did. It was yeah. so beautiful. It yeah. really was. I mean, the I, it, it was, yeah. it, there were so many happy accidents in it. Because the light light was bouncing, it it was oddly bouncing all over the place, but horizontally. Like yeah. I, it's as if I said, "Okay, you, light, you can't go more than two inches above where you're focused," and that's yeah. what it did. From a, from it, a it watch was, light from a, a par sixty four. Exactly. Has anybody ever duplicated that? Because I I don't know if any people use that trick, but I but I remember it because I thought, "Oh, what a great." What a great well, way to do it. Well, I don't think there's anything like a par can that could do it. Actually, you <laughs> couldn't take one of these these strip lights. They're no. not strong enough yet. Right. They will be one day, though. Yeah, they will yeah, be. We'll true. have them on the side doing exactly that. I can't right. believe you remember that. Oh, I have a memory like an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> I've got good stuff. His math skills <laughs> suck, but his memory is great. My math skills <laughs> and my typing are terrible. <laughs> but, you know. Typing's terrible, too. To the muslin was starch. That's an important part if anybody oh. ever wants to make one. It was did have starch in it so that it covered up, so that the holes were filled in in the muslin. Oh. You, you know, so that there wasn't, it wasn't. So you wouldn't see the sources that way yeah, yeah. as it hit the the bounce yeah, it drop. Just, yeah. It was just something, and I just I just I could, wish I could have seen it live. But I'm going to go back even further in my when I get to the next question. But Steve has the next question. Yeah, we got a question from a student um, regarding uh, Diana, and she writes, "I have seen the Netflix recording of Diana, and I saw the closing performance on Broadway." What was it like to adopt a show for streaming, especially one that only had a handful of previews before the shutdown? And when you returned to officially reopen the show, did you or the production team feel any pressure not to stray away from the look you achieved streaming? Wow. I wish I could ask her if she liked the show. We, you know, she the, did. Oh, she She's did. one of my students. She loved the show. Yeah, we got handed a bad rap from some of those critics because I love that show. Um, the uh, the we we filmed it during the pandemic. We like three months into the pandemic. I think we were the only ones at that point who had done something like that. So it was. It was scary, exciting. You know, they knocked on your door to drop food off uh, in your hotel room. You weren't allowed to see anybody. We all walked together. We couldn't leave. We couldn't go to a coffee shop. So I was, you know, 30 blocks from my home, but I couldn't go home. It was it was so exciting and intense to film that. And I haven't done a lot of that kind of work. So I definitely learned a lot. It was um 
You know, I think for um, Declan Quinn is the cinematographer. And then we ended up doing another project after that, actually, that uh, I mean, you probably all know more about this than I do, but, you know, they really need a softer kind of light than we give um, in the theater. We're, and also, you know, if somebody's looking stage left and the camera's coming from stage left, the upstage side of their face isn't filled in because they can't get cameras there. We can't get lights there. So all of that, we we figured it all out. Declan had a lot of soft lights that we, he put all over the set, but his idea was to, you know, make it look as much as it, like it looked on Broadway. So that all went really well. And then uh, the question was whether we felt no pressure to make it look like what the show looked like streamed, meaning that we, the director, the producer, all, we just wanted the best Broadway show that we could have. So Ultimately, the two shows are very similar, but if if they had wanted to completely change it, I'm sure they would have, but they didn't want to. So there was no pressure other than to make a great show, which I thought we did. Now, we've already established that there was this show called The FX in Las Vegas, and it was a very important time in your life, which I didn't know that little detail, but I did see that production, and I was really excited to see it. And I think we might agree that the story is not so great, uh, the FX. That was my opinion. But there was a moment in that show that I have remembered to this day. It was really beautiful and incredibly clever. And, and I think somebody wrote an article about it, and I think I understand how it was done. But I want to know how it came to be, if it was a happy accident. And let me just describe to you what I saw. There was a moment in the show when the lead character, played by at the time, I think it was David Cassidy, um, right? And he's in this little spaceship and he's moving around the stage, flying in this little spaceship. And you're, I think you're using a Verilite and I think you're using what they call the laser cone gobo or whatever it is. It's like a ring. And it's their backlight and it's hazed, and I'm thinking that there's a really great backdrop, and that the article talked about that it was the little spaceship was like the arm of a of a high a high ranger, and you but you and it was covered in black, and you couldn't see it. And I thought, how brilliant is this? Because it looked like the light was sort of creating this curtain effect, and the follow spot or whatever tracked him in the spaceship, and. And I just thought this was the most clever thing I ever saw. So could you talk about that moment, how it came to be? And was it thought through or was it a happy accident or how did it, um, or am I completely making this up and is it a myth? No, that's all true. That's all true. That's 27 years ago. Yes. Well, I'm old. <laughs> but I can My still remember. Yeah, and I can remember it. My, I can remember it though. That was talked about. That was definitely designed. It was designed. That was really talked about. I mean, that was an that it was a cherry picker essentially yeah. that he was in. Uh, he was lit by uplights okay. that were in the. He was wasn't lit with He's a false spot he, lights because, in the bucket. Yeah, because if he was lit with a false spot, the spot yeah, would have hit the backdrop. Right. right. Yeah. And, um, you know, there was even today, I don't think you could really track him. I guess we could now with Zach Track or Black, Black Tracks. tracks. Yeah. We probably could. And the backlight effect that was thought through and tested and designed to get that sort of. Mm, on, I think there was more conversation, you know, that if we have a lot of haze in the air and, and, backlight somehow that we won't see the arm. Yeah, that's the question. How did you hide the base yeah. of the cherry picker and the arm? It, it's, you know, it, it it kind of all goes back to Svoboda in a right. way, you know, light mm -hmm. curtains. It's walls of light yeah. through um, through haze, yeah. really, is what it was. Really? So uh, that's that's how we did it. I mean, we I think we were all pretty confident about that mm -hmm. effect at the mm -hmm. time that it would work. I, I We did not do any kind of demo right. of that. We just, I guess, 
cross our fingers and hope for the best. Well, it was magic. And we, I, I think we knew ultimately, you know, we could always just uplight him. It's not, if you couldn't turn on, if you couldn't right. turn on a light. Well, 20, 27 was, years it, ago, it was, it was like, oh, wow, this can be, this is magic, you know, and, and it. Oh, yeah, I guess so. That probably was never done no, before. No, it wasn't. Yeah. I never, I, it was like, oh, wow, I, can I duplicate this? I need to know the recipe for this because it was so good. Yeah, yeah. Well, wasn't that the yeah. point of that show? It was called EFX because it just had all kinds of really weird technical stuff going on in all four of oh, the yeah. sections. Oh, yeah, projectors everywhere and all that, yeah. And that dragon, Merlin, that had the dragon, an articulated yeah. head. And that show had a very long gestation period, if I recall. Well, she it was did. giving birth. She was <laughs> right. <laughs> That's I, right. I want to know when did when did this event happen? Did it happen in previews? That was it in, during tax? Was it you know what did you just open? I mean, and how did that work? I think that's really I, fascinating. It was a long gestation period, so I was not pregnant when it started. Oh, okay. And then I did get pregnant I, whenever. So we were supposed to open in September. I think I was like six months pregnant or something. She was My daughter was born in December, so wow. whatever, six five, six months pregnant, whatever. Right. And then the show got postponed. Oh. Well, first of all, you know, J Jerry Harris was the producer okay. and um, – I just really have to, you know, he gets a huge shout out for completely supporting mm, me through wow, it. Wow, fantastic. And uh, yeah, really fantastic. Way ahead of his time, unfortunately, but it's true. Thank God you Not did. Not a yeah. moment of, oh my God, this is going to be a problem, anything like that. Never, ever, ever. And then, um, and then I, I, then the show got postponed and I was in Las Vegas for, whatever I was probably visiting for a week and I did call my husband and we had a talk and <laughs> said, okay, we got to find a doctor <laughs> in Las Vegas. And then, um, and then I did work up. Uh, uh, I did work up until the day before I went in, into the hospital wow. and I'll, okay. I'll tell you this one story. Okay, go, is, <laughs> Light talk special. I got, I, uh, I, I, um, I got to the hospital. I was probably there for like three hours and an electrician called me up and at the hospital, I, did we have cell phones in 1980? In 1994? No, very early, like, you know, yeah, Motorola flip phones, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, or maybe, I think he called me in the hospital yeah. room and I was like, Oh my God, this is so sweet of you to call me. He said, has your baby been born? And I said, no, not yet. And then he said, Shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I, he, he, he had put his bet on at that at 10, uh -huh. 10, 10 that morning. That uh, she'd be that's born. Funny. So oh, yeah, no, they, somebody made like 800 bucks off my oh, daughter's no, birth. No. You see, I, I thought, it is Las Vegas. Vegas. Vegas, of course, sorry. and and I and I thought you were gonna say that he was gonna ask you if he could two for fixtures seven and eight together. And you know, the day I went, the day I arrived in the hospital, the set was so big. It's Alan, huge. you saw the show, yep. did you see? Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's huge. It's like a hundred feet yeah. wide and like sixty feet deep. This enormous piece of scenery came on Merlin's den, and it <laughs> the whole deck Moved. as it as it tracked yeah. on, the whole deck went. And oh, no. it, uh, the scenery was too heavy for him. Oh, so in God. the day, I, I've always thought Roy Sears, who was a carpenter, did that on purpose for me <laughs> so that I didn't have to because nobody could work for two weeks. So I had two weeks. <laughs> uh, my darling daughter and then i went back oh, to work right. he that's intentionally funny. sabotaged the show what i think he did it for me birth. what a guy i can't remember what, what the show was about though it was about merlin and jules verne and yeah, that's um, right pt barnum and somebody else and there were four sections and just how extraordinary it all was that sounds pretty well cool. ellen you what got was a the fourth one memory really houdini yeah. houdini right there you go houdini so, so um, Natasha, uh, most of us here are, chi are children of the 70s. And uh, I love, personally, I love Bruce Springsteen. I mean, you know, amazing, amazing artist um, and a true American songwriter. What was it like to work on The Boss in, in, on Broadway? I, I, I just got full body chills as you said that. <laughs> About thinking back at the time? 
about, you know, I know how people feel about him yeah. and, um, yeah. uh, and also what the experience was like, definitely mm. top three experiences of wow. my mm. career The he was incredible to work with really, really nice. Everybody who's worked with them has been there for like 40 years. And if you, um, you know, if, if you think of his songs and how descriptive mm. they are and poetic, mm. that's the way he was as a director because he directed it. Wow. So he, that. he talked in imagery mm. to me. We sat wow. together, we talked about it. He, he was not an absent director in any way, shape or form. And it was all through images really. Nice. So it was never, oh, I wish, because it was a, the set that Heather Walensky did, which was quite beautiful, was kind of a backstage kind of looking warehouse uh, brick wall in the back. So the imagery was never, oh, I wish it was a little light on the back wall. It was more like, and I traveled through the country, and this is oh, the way cool. I was feeling, mm. and the sun was rising, and you know things like mm. that. And I, it it was it was extraordinary. It was an, an incredible experience. That's great. Not to mention to listen to him oh, every yeah, night. I can just imagine. You know, I mean, I've we've all been fortunate to meet our heroes, you know, and people who have inspired us, artists. And uh, that's, you know, one person I would just love to meet and talk to for for a while. Uh, did you ever have a chance to uh, meet uh, Stevie Van Zant? Was he hanging around there? He wasn't. Oh, I never met him. Because that's another guy I'd like to hang out and talk with. Yeah. Well, you should do his show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, right. That's true. <laughs> and then Bill, I'll Bill, ask Bill, you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, Bill no. Maher was interviewing him, uh, I think, last season. It was really interesting. But what great stories that all those all the guys in the band had and women in the band have, um, you know, we, we had these six Sharpies mm -hmm. that for the rising, I don't know. It's about nine 11, mm. the song. And they were, there were three stage left, three stage, right. And they sort of made a, a diagonal cross mm. over him. Not, not like a religious cross, but they cross like sort of fingers of, God over him. And I, you know, um, and I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll turn them on at a key change and I'll just leave them on for the end of the song. And he saw them and he said, he said, uh, just have them come up and have them go away. Mm. And it was an extraordinary, it was just so, because it was the, the sort of the metaphor of life and death mm. so quickly, mm. how fleeting it is. Somehow he captured that in mm. that moment. That's yeah. what I mean about his Power, input poetry. into all yeah. of it. Well, well Very you know, a, he's a, he's an amazing storyteller, but also he's a musician and an incredible composer and he understands how light and music connect. And I think no he question. saw that image and he saw, you know, it as just another extension, another instrument in the composition of the moment of the song. And he said, it's so like, yeah, play the guitar for this, for the bridge, but then let it drop out for the next verse. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, so that story does not surprise me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Because, but unfortunately, so few people realize this, you know, and a lot of directors don't realize it because they may not be musicians. Uh, but yeah, that's fantastic. That's a wonderful story. Yeah, yeah. This is so interesting, isn't it? That somebody who you wouldn't think is a director mm. like him. It's one of the best uh, directors I ever worked mm. with. I believe it. I, I, you know, it's just, it just makes I, sense. Yeah, I can he, see that you, know, you totally know what I'm talking about. <laughs> he just, he just totally, you know, this is what he does on stage all the time. Yeah. You know, it's beautiful. Um, so you talked a minute before about the choreography for MJ. Uh, with Christopher Wielden, uh, and you've had a long collaboration with him. I think you've worked on a lot of other dance pieces. So can we talk a little about your dance work as well and his pieces? Well, most of my dance work is with Chris, actually. Uh, I've done some other, I've done other things, other things, but most of it's with Chris. Um, uh, you know, it's been 20 years now. Mm. I'm just wow. beginning to put it all together. We met on Sweet Smell of Success. Nick Heitner found him. Well, Bob, Bob Crowley, Nick Heitner, I, I, I don't know which one anymore found him, but um, he'd been a dancer at City Ballet. And then Chris 
he's, you know, a lot younger than I am. He, he asked me to do a ballet at San Francisco ballet with him right after we did sweet smell of success. I, you know, I don't know why, I don't know any of it anymore, except we clicked. Except you're and, really talented. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> And then Chris moved into this narrative world, you know, of trying to tell stories rather than sort of abstract ballets. And well, I don't know, we moved into that world together. It, um, I, I, you know, we're in each other's head. It's, it's, it, I don't know what else to say about it. He, uh, somehow we, we've found each other. Um, I, I, I don't know what half of the ballet terms he's using are. I, 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 you know, I, it doesn't matter. We we found some other language. So, you know, maybe for listeners, that's a good thing to know. You, we, I think is actually as lighting designers, you know, this idea that a director says to you, oh, I'd like to see a sunset. And then we say to ourselves, okay, one at full or whatever, the, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. So what are we, you know, we're really interpreters and, and, um, we are translators all the time, but what do we do? We translate, we may not be able to add up 560, but <laughs> we translate all this stuff into to numbers. Mm -hmm. And then the number actually comes out as some kind of art. So we're, we're interpreters and translators and lighting's really kind of an amazing job that, you know, so few people really understand it. But anyway, somehow I found the right numbers. With I Chris. think you just made the title of the show, The Translator. Right. I like it. You know, it's interesting because um, Howell Binkley, who was as pro prolific a lighting designer as you are, also had a long term standing relationship with a choreographer, uh, David Parsons. And I just wondered whether, you know, it's sort of like um, changing gears a little bit, like, oh, my God, I've just done six huge musicals. I need to take a little break. And you do something a little more artistic, a little smaller scale, just breathe a little bit into it. And, you know, it's another world. You know, that's a really good point, Ellen. I see what you're asking. It, it's true. It uses different muscles. There's no question about it. And it does. It is. It, it, yeah, it, uh, it's it's sort of a little more fanciful on. I, I don't know what the right word is, but it does. Listen, it doesn't have the same pressure as the millions and millions of dollars on a Broadway musical. Or even this off-Broadway musical that I'm doing right now doesn't have the same kind of pressure. But also, Chris is Chris is not dissimilar to Bruce Springsteen in that he's just so visual, and um, I, uh, he just makes me a better lighting designer than I ever thought I could be because his ideas never stop coming. Uh, my head is spinning most of the time when Chris is talking to me because the ideas just never stop. So maybe that's what I'm attracted to in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Why don't we build on that a little bit? You know, we have students all the time asking about collaboration. You know, what what is your process? What is your vocabulary? When do you know? Uh, I mean, you clearly just spoke on on when it's working. When it's not quite working, how do you nudge it? Oof. Yeah, it's hard when it's not working. But it always works. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> For our listeners at home, Natasha has been a uh, cyclorama. She has been a parkan on a boom. <laughs> she has been beams of light in the air. She's, uh, she's waved her hands and been a fog machine. And now she's, she's taken the pose of the thinker, trying to figure out uh, quite how to answer this question. Oh, my God. It, it's funny. It's, I, I, it's funny how it all comes down to personal, uh, personal interactions mm -hmm. with people. And I th think I, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I do feel like I'm a chameleon, you know, and a big part of my job is to really listen and try. To, it's what we were just talking about. It's really trying to figure out what is it that the director and the set designer and all the other people that we have to respond to. What are they, what is the story that they're trying to tell? And sometimes you, when we're not, like you, the question was, uh, one part of the question is like when you're not, when it's not clicking, I, I, I think what I try to do is try to figure out what is it that, what, if something's really not clicking, what is it that they want? And sometimes it can just be personality. You know, sometimes they can just not like you. And then that's that, you know, you'll never click. 
but uh, and some and sometimes it's out of their own insecurity. I, I, I it's just it's just personal. It just becomes so personal. But I think a huge part of it is for me is really just trying to understand what it is that they're trying to do. I, 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 I have I have ideas in the back of my head, but I am there to serve. I sound like Darren Devern. I'm a service business, but I, I, I do feel that way. You know, I'm there to tell their story, their viewpoint on what the story is. Let, let me ask you a little sidebar question here. I mean, as a lighting designer, we know what your job is. As more and more video projection comes in to the show, what's that collaboration like? Because all of a sudden there's video that's adding a great deal of light into the show. Yeah, really good question. I think we're all struggling with that. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way at all. Um, for me, one of the, it, I've had great experiences and there's no question that video adds such an incredible layer to the storytelling and to what a show looks like. But I would say on a technical, from a technical point of view, that the hardest part is that um is literally foreground and background. And, you know, I was taught, and I do it when I'm lighting my shows, if there's no video designer, I bring up the background first. That's where I start. I start by making the environment. And then I'm not saying that it's easy to light actors' faces, but then I work on the actor's faces because the background for me so determines what the foreground is going to be. So when a video designer... It's determining the background, the brightness, the color, all of that. Then it's in a whole different world. You know, then we're then I'm saying to the video designer, could you just make that a little darker? There's a key change here. Could we do this? Could we do that? It's it it, it it's uh, I think we're all going to find our vocabularies as the years go on, you know, so and and they're like us, you know, they're chameleons and and. Some of them are chameleons and <laughs> some are collaborators, some aren't. So I don't know. I think we have a road ahead, but it's a great part of our business. We just have to find out how to talk to each other. Yeah. And the ones who aren't usually don't last very long. Well, good riddance. <laughs> <laughs> Ride the oh, way no. or be buried That's by it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to make it in this business. Oh, what do you really think there? <laughs> I, maybe you should edit that out. <laughs> no, I, you know, oh, I'm no, joking. Fantastic. No, I think your point <laughs> off with their head. The foreground is really, is really key, right, in terms of making the mm -hmm. composition. Yeah. That's the problem is, the, is that so many directors don't realize that. And they're saying, what are you lighting the background for? I can't see the, oh, I'll get there. Give me a minute, yeah. I'll get there, give me a minute, I'll get there. Don't worry about it, you know? And, or you, you bring up something generic just so that they can see the face and then you still work on the background and then you fix the foreground. But it's, you know, it, it is a battle for people who don't know your process. Uh, that's so well said, David. That's exactly, that's I'm good right. for one of those a day, so I'm done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 so Stan has our last question, well, right? Yeah, this is one of our That's stock it. questions, but we love to ask it because we do have a lot of student listeners. So, a lot of students. So what advice would you give to young designers starting out today? Uh, I, um, what would you tell your younger self, maybe? If you were growing uh, up today, <laughs> because it's different, right? I'm still growing from <laughs> crying enough. out loud. So if oh you, my if god! You were, if you were like 17 or 18 years old today, and you know, post COVID, we hope, we pray, you know, how how do you? What advice would you give? I, um, well, I, you know, what I think some of it's been in this talk that we've had. Uh, the. Um, I, I think getting in touch with designers in terms of getting work is important. I'm a great believer in working for other designers because that's the way I grew up by working for Roger and I worked with um, Jules Fisher for a long time and Ken Billington. These people were so important to uh, Marsha Madeira. They were, I became who I am because of them, no question about it. And being in the room and watching them, how they interacted with directors and things like that, because our world is everything that we were just talking about. It is not just what you learn in school. Um, I would say that uh, just to try to design as much as you can. I mean, my first shows in New York City were with little Rhea 
you know, <laughs> home dimmers that I put a rubber band on to master them. I hung my own lights. You know, no, there's you you don't get to the top overnight. It's yeah. all those things that we think it is. Um, get in touch with designers. Oh, there's so many other things. Oh my God, I'm missing all the important things. Like. Uh, uh, read the newspaper, read books, read plays, uh, people reference to direct. And this is not just about the theater because, and let's also say that this conversation is not just about the theater, which is that I do believe knowing about as a lighting designer, knowing about the theater, is a great way to start because you learn about storytelling so much, but this all can branch out off into event design, architectural design, being an electrician, going into the world of rock and roll. There are just so many avenues as a lighting designer. It can take you to production management. If you decide that you, it can, it can just, it, you can become a, a movie producer by the time it's done or a producer, David. Um, oh my Byrne? God. No, not David Byrne. Oh, Richard Winkler. Oh, Richard. Who used to be, his, he was a great lighting designer, worked mm -hmm. as Theron's assistant for mm -hmm. so many years. He's producing shows on Broadway now. You know, you know <laughs> the, the road is long. We all know that. You know, I know what all of you have done in your careers. Look at that. And working, I drafted for years for Roger Morgan and for Jules and their architectural firms. I learned about riser diagrams, all of that. I worked in, in at all those Disney, all the Disney, um at the at the parks and it's just there's so many jobs for young lighting designers so the references become really important when somebody's referring to like a janet jackson video or somebody's referring to it's a terrible reference but you know just all this sort of war-torn mm. stuff that you're seeing in the Horrible. ukraine you know that can affect um th those are that's those are images that stay with you forever and people are going to start referencing those or music that you hear, listen to a lot of music, all of that stuff becomes part of a vocabulary that as a young designer and me, as I get older, you can start to reference all that. And it's a way to talk to each other. I didn't know any of that. You know, I didn't know. Oh my God, if I had just gone to the museum and looked at that Vermeer, I might've been able to say, Oh, look at this. This is what it could look like. It's really a head high from stage left. So there it is. I wow. don't know if that helps it or not. Does. It, it does. Wonderful. So we agree wholeheartedly with all uh, of that. Well, it's it's uh, beautiful. You sure we're not 17 anymore? We are. We definitely are. <laughs> no, thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, my girlfriend told us that. She goes, I, I still feel 18, you know? And it's... Uh, it was funny because uh, <laughs> she had never seen All About Eve, and we watched it last night. And I said, you want to know what the theater's like? <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> oh, my God. And don't, don't be Eve. Don't, that's, that's my, my suggestion to people. Don't but, be Evie because people remember, especially in the theater. That's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, uh, we do, you do need to be kind to yeah. everybody because they're going to be around as long as you're going to be around. Mm -hmm. And if you're not... Kind. Yeah, don't burn your don't them. burn your bridges. I have a recommendation yeah. since Natasha referenced Ukraine. I don't know if you know this, but Zelensky's uh, show "Servant of the People" has been put back on Netflix. Yeah, and we are right. in we are in episode three. Now remember that he made this, and he became in the show. You know, he was a high school teacher who becomes president. So this is an example <laughs> of not of, rather than art imitating life, it's life imitating mm. art. And it's very interesting to watch that, knowing what's happening at the moment and who he is. Mm. So I highly recommend it while it's up there. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Natasha, no, thank you yeah. so much for being with us today. Unfortunately, we have to stop because we're, we're like uh, at our limit. We're over right an hour. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're I'm now. sorry. But I, I've been... but no, no, you're no, fantastic. No, it's great. Fantastic. Interview. You have to it, come back it, again. I'm not, I'm not cutting any of it. Because, <laughs> you know, we, we've had Ken on the show. We've had Dwayne. We had a lot of, lot of really great lighting designers. And you certainly rank, you know, with them. With the legends of you're light, in the as pantheon we call them. Of, of anniversary and, and some shows. of them are like over an hour long. And that's cool because you have so much to say. So thank you so much. And thank you for being a fan of the show as well. <laughs> no, I love your show. I love your show so much. So that, I feel honored to be here oh, on your fifth that anniversary. Is so weird. <laughs> anniversary. God, you know, you know we, I, we usually have a big star for the fifth anniversary. And we, we were talking about who to get. 
And uh, and Allison, you know, I think I could talk Natasha into this if I don't tell her what show it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so if you can get Natasha, man, that would be a huge, huge find. That's fantastic. Yeah, and, what show is this, by the way? I've been meaning to ask <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> the rocking sounds and illuminoids tells us that once again you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, Amazon Prime Music, and just about every other podcast site out there. Check out our website on LightTalk.org for future guests, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to the podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, accept the information from Natasha, but if you do decide to litigate, the law firm of Flex, Flux, Flare, and Glare and their paralegal Snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sista, coming to you from New York, St. Bart, Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to join us next week when we chat about more useless things and explore the crazy shenanigans in our industry. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. Thanks again, Natasha. It was fantastic. And Absolutely. we will see you, everyone, next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Thank Light Talk. Thank you so much, Natasha Tetz. I really enjoyed oh, that was it. Great. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, thank you, guys. Very eloquent. That was awesome. Lumen Brothers.